a distinguished group of presenters on this uh, very interesting and important topic. Um, I do have on the bottom here, I, I, uh, my, my day job is, uh, is as a U.S. government economist, so the views expressed are not necessarily those of the U.S. Department of Justice. Although, in fact, the U.S. Department of Justice does value anti-monopoly law and probably would explain it this way. Um, I also want to say that I think, um, I think you will enjoy the combination of uh, my presentation with that that follows me with, uh, with uh, Maria Nizhnik, my friend, who's the deputy chairman of the Anti-Monopoly Committee in Ukraine. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is talk about anti-monopoly policy in general, how it has evolved, and what it consists of broadly in the U.S., in the, in the EU, and, and in Ukraine. And then she will, uh, she will give you a more detailed discussion of some of the important issues that have arisen in the Ukrainian context, including some of the important cases. So I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing her discuss some of that. So in the United States, we, uh, we uh, essentially enacted the first competition law around 125 years ago. The Sherman Act was enacted in 1890. Canadians enacted a competition law about the same time. Um, and the EU got on board much later, after World War II. Um, but the, the general purpose of the laws and the general ideas of the laws and the general um, I want you to take away from this in terms of the broad context of competition law is that competition law or antitrust law or anti-monopoly law, which I will use interchangeably, um, the, the purpose is to protect the process of competition. So we are believers in markets. Those of us who enforce and write and talk about competition laws are believers that markets usually work. Um, but we want to make sure that businesses don't take actions which prevent markets from working. And that is the focus of anti-monopoly policy, competition law, competition policy. So the basic provisions of competition law are three. Uh, basically, the Sherman Act, Section 1 of the Sherman Act, prohibits agreements among enterprises that would reduce competition. And I'm going to get into more detail about each of these provisions in a few minutes. Section 2 of the Sherman Act prohibits monopolization of a market, which for the rest of the world is usually discussed as abuse of a dominant position on the market. So that's single firm conduct as opposed to multi-firm conduct. And then after the Sherman Act was enacted in 1890, um, there was about uh, 25 years before the second competition law was enacted in the U.S. Uh, during that 25 years, there was a merger wave because, or at least some people believe, that this reflected the fact that companies could not reach agreements with their competitors and they couldn't take certain actions to disadvantage their competitors, but they could buy their competitors. And there was nothing in the Sherman Act, as it was interpreted, which prohibited mergers and acquisitions among competitors. So in 1914, our Congress passed the Clayton Act which added a provision, Section 7, which prohibited, which said that any merger or acquisition, takeover, any of those, those things, hostile takeover, friendly takeover, any of those, which significantly reduced competition in a market would also be illegal. And between the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act and those three provisions, those were essentially the three legs of the stool of competition law in the U.S since 1950. And since 1945 in the EC, or 1950 or 55, since 1989 in the post-socialist world and many developing countries, those three provisions, agreements among enterprises, single firm conduct, slash abuse of a dominant position, and anti-competitive mergers and acquisitions have been the basic tools of competition law everywhere. U.S., E.C., Japan, Korea, South Africa, Russia, Ukraine. Now, there are a couple of other provisions that I won't talk much about because I don't 
know anything about them because we don't do them in the U.S. Um, many competition laws in Europe, and especially in my experience in Eastern Europe, um, also have provisions against anti-competitive actions by local governments. So actions by local governments, especially to protect their local firms, which may in fact be partially owned by people in the local government, um, those are addressed by provisions in the Ukrainian law, in, in the EC law, not really in the U.S. law. And similarly, uh, there's a whole section of the EC law, a very big and complicated and controversial section dealing with what are called state aids. Um, formal government provisions to aid certain enterprises, usually in the name of uh, protecting against bankruptcy or addressing regional unemployment issues. And that's again something that's not part of US law, and so I won't really discuss it. What I didn't put on the slide is what's not part of competition law, and that's what I want to emphasize also, which is that generally competition law is not about the outcomes of competition. It's about the process. So in my day-to-day -day work in the competition agency in the US, I never bring a case against a firm for monopoly prices. In fact, I don't even have that authority, so I don't even investigate. We don't have authority in the U.S. to investigate high prices. And I think you may in Ukraine, I think the EC does, but doesn't bring many cases. In fact, I don't think they've brought any in years. But in the U.S., we don't have the process, we don't have the authority, and in general, competition laws are not focused on, did this firm charge too high a price? Or is this firm earning monopoly profits? That's generally not what we're about when we're enforcing competition laws. Occasionally, some agencies bring those cases, but generally not. So, let's go into more detail about the three basic provisions of most competition laws. Agreements among enterprises, Sherman Act, Section 1, the Europe Treaty, Article 101, I think I've got that right, it keeps changing every five years or so. Uh, and the Ukrainian law, Articles 5 to, uh, to 11. The first focus of the Sherman Act and on all of these provisions of these laws is on horizontal agreements. That is, agreements between competitors or potential competitors. Agreements among firms at the same level of the chain of production. But they also generally address vertical agreements. So agreements between contracts or agreements or arrangements between a manufacturer and its supplier, a steel manufacturer and its, and its uh, iron ore supplier, or a steel manufacturer and its distributor. Those could, those are, those could agree, those agreements among those enterprises could also be subject to these provisions. The most serious parts of a competition law, the most serious violations of the competition law have to do with horizontal agreements that are called cartel agreements. And those are agreements between competitors, horizontal agreements, as to the basic terms of competition. What prices they will charge. I'm going to raise my price by 10 grivnas this year. Yes, I'll do the same. I'm going to sell to customers in eastern Ukraine. You stay out of there because you can sell to customers in western Ukraine, and I'll stay out of there. I'm going to sell to Walmart. OK, that's fine. You sell to the local hypermarket, and we won't compete with each other. I'm going to bid this amount when the local government puts out a procurement for asphalt for building roads. Those kinds of agreements among enterprises, among competitors, are considered the most serious violations of the competition law. They are in contrast to something that we might call joint venture agreements. There are plenty of agreements among competitors that are not on their face anti-competitive. Agreements among competitors to do research and development, to develop a new product. Agreements among competitors to work together to penetrate a new territory, to compete against the dominant firm. Those on their face may be pro-competitive, although they may also be subject to competition law investigation. All right, cartel agreements, the most serious violations of the competition law. In the U.S., cartel agreements are pretty much the only part of the law that are per se illegal, the only behavior that is per se illegal. And what that means is that unlike everything else in the competition law, 
if we are investigating the possible existence of a cartel, we don't focus on its economic impact. We simply focus on whether there was an agreement or not. If your competitor says to you, let's raise prices tomorrow, and you say, yes, I agree, that's the violation. You have already violated the law. And that's what our lawyers are going to try to prove if they take you to court. Discussing how much you raised price, how much you harmed customers, that may come later when we figure out maybe how much money you have to pay back or something like that. But this is the only part of the U.S. competition law and increasingly part of other competition laws that is illegal on its face, per se, in the Latin term. Once you say, yes, I agree, or, now I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, but once you, your competitor says, I'm going to raise price, and you nod and wink, I'm not sure exactly what may constitute an agreement among competitors sitting around a, sitting around a table with a beer. But once you agree, that's a section of the law, what's an agreement? But once you agree, you violated the law. And in the U.S. at least, and again, increasingly in other countries, there is criminal punishment for cartel agreements. So if you agree with your competitor to raise prices, you may go to jail. And every year we send company sales managers, vice presidents, even presidents, entrepreneurs to jail for agreeing with their competitors as to what price they will charge or what they will bid for a government bid. Um, and this is, as I say, this is increasingly taking place in the rest of the world as well. The UK, they have begun to do this. Brazil, they've begun to do this. Several other countries have added provisions in the law that haven't yet put anybody in jail. Um, but this has been a very important part of our uh, enforcement to make it very, very clear to entrepreneurs and competitors that if your competitor offers you a deal like this, you should say no. Because if you say yes, you really, the average jail term these days is two years for people convicted of violating Section 1 of the Sherman Act. The fines, I don't know what the average fine is, but the fines for companies have been going up in years. The ceiling has gone up. We have, I don't think I have it in my notes, but we have something like um, 15 or 20 criminal fines against firms for more than $100 million because these have been international firms engaged in international cartels that have, that have raised the price on so much of their output just for U.S. companies. And we don't have the authority to fine you if you raise prices for Ukrainian companies. We only have the authority to fine you if you raise the price for U.S. companies. But big fines these days and big criminal punishments. Now, if criminal, if, sorry, if cartel behavior is per se illegal and punished criminally, how do we find out about it? it used to be people would, would make it easy for us, they would sign cartel agreements. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, they, so, so we have to figure out how to prove that these people have reached agreements. How do we do that? And how do we detect them in the first place? Well, very often we get complaints from customers. Companies that buy steel um, may call us and say, hey guys, these three companies used to compete for my business. Now suddenly, only one of them is offering a bid. Or suddenly they've all raised their prices 20% at the same time. What's going on here? I think there must be a cartel. That's a good source of information for that. We can, we can investigate that, and that's one of the reasons that we as a competition agency, and I expect the Anti-Monopoly Committee of Ukraine as well, try to make sure that our businesses know very well what the law is. Partly so they will know not to violate it, but partly also so that they will know to let us know if they think they are the victims of a violation. Um, partly we may hear from insiders, either whistleblowers or maybe disgruntled former insiders. So somebody who used to work for the firm, got fired, and knows about this, calls us up and says, hey, I want to tell you what these guys are doing. So <laughs> companies, companies learn you don't fire somebody if they know about the cartel, and you keep the knowledge very, very close. Uh, occasionally, we, get, we even get calls from ex-wives who say, uh, by the way, <laughs> my, hus my husband left me for his hot young secretary. Let me tell you what else he's done. <laughs> First, I want to tell you about his hot young secretary, but I also want to tell you that he's been raising prices. Uh, 
so, you know, we understand the motives of these people are not necessarily pure, uh, but sometimes they have good information for us. So when we have, when we have, conservative, when we have conservative bosses, when we have we're Republican presidents, we like to tell them we're a pro-family agency because we uh, encourage executives to stay with their wives. <laughs> but, more seriously, the most important way that we hear about cartels and proof cartels is our leniency policy, otherwise known as our amnesty policy. And those of you who have lived in a, in a country that had the KGB may find there are certain similarities here, which we apologize for only a little bit. Um, if you are in a cartel, whether you as an individual or you as a firm, if you are in a cartel, and you contact Department of Justice and say, listen, I want to tell you, I want to confess, I was wrong, I've done something evil here, I want to cooperate, I feel terrible about this. If you are the first person to do this, <laughs> you win the lottery. <laughs> now you will still have some, you will still have some punishment, you will still have some damages to pay back to your customers. Uh, and you have to cooperate with us fully. If we discover you haven't been telling us everything, the deal is off. And if we discover you organized the cartel, the deal is off. You can't organize a cartel and then call DOJ. <laughs> but if you were just one of the participants and you decide to come to us and confess, and you're the first person in the door, no criminal punishment. The executives don't go to jail, no criminal fine for the company. Later on, you pay, you pay back your customers. The idea, of course, speaking of microeconomics, is to set up a uh, prisoner's dilemma in game theory terms. We want everybody in the conspiracy to be a little bit worried that somebody else in the conspiracy is going to come forward. Um, we have a saying in the US, I don't know if you have this in Ukraine, there is no honor among thieves. So we hope all these guys are a little concerned. And in fact, we have, we have seen this in action. Um, one of the very first international cartels that we, that we uh, prosecuted under the leniency policy uh, was the so-called Lysine cartel. Uh, Archer Daniels Midland was one of the big companies. They, in fact, um, their, one of their executives called up and got leniency. There's a movie about this. Um, it's called The Informant. Uh, and you might enjoy this. It's pretty much true. It's a, it's a, little, you know, it's a movie, so it's not all true, but, but you might enjoy this. Um, when, I, when I used to, when the movie first came out, I used to tell the women in the audience that they should see this movie because um, Matt Damon was in it, so they would want to see it. Now, now if I say that, they tell me, yeah, I'll tell my mother to see the movie. <laughs> anyway, Matt Damon plays the informant. He plays the guy who gets cold feet, comes to the OJ, and confesses. Um, and in this case, we don't always do this. In fact, I don't think we do it very often. Uh, but in this case, we got the FBI involved and we decided to have the Matt Damon character wear a wire, wear a microphone, and go into another cartel meeting. And so they had a cartel meeting in this hotel room. Uh, Matt Damon, or sorry, the, the, uh, the, the informant was wearing a microphone. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, guy, the guy, the bellboy pushing in the coffee was an FBI agent. The coffee machine had a microphone on it. The lamp had a, had a camera on it. So the quality isn't real great, but we actually have a DVD tape uh, a DVD, I guess you don't call them DVD tape, sorry, I'm showing my age. We have a DVD of this cartel meeting. Um, and one of the things that happens in the meeting is that one of the cartel members is late to the meeting. And you start seeing these guys get a little worried. They're sort of fidgeting and say, well, where's Fred? What, what happened to Fred? Usually Fred's on time, where's Fred? And finally somebody says, well, you, you don't think Fred, what, nah, you don't think Fred called DOJ, do you? No, 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 no. Fred, well, Fred's a good guy. Fred, well, but you can almost see these guys reaching for their cell phones because if Fred gets to DOJ before they do, they go to jail and Fred doesn't. Well, it turned out they were suspecting the wrong guy. The, the guy who went to DOJ was already in the room. But anyway, that's how we need to work. And we believe that that, that that is, well, let's see. I think we know that that is a force behind most of our cartel detection and punishment. Um, now, of course, we don't know what percentage of cartels we detect and punish because there may be a whole lot out there that we don't find out about. 
But increasingly, since we formalized and instituted leniency in the early 90s, we have uh, succeeded in using it to detect our um, Other countries have followed our example in this. Um, I think Ukraine has a leniency policy. I know Russia does. I know many other countries do. The problem has been that for the leniency policy to work, you have to have really, really serious punishment for the cartel behavior. Otherwise, nobody's scared. If you don't have criminal punishment, if you have small fines, the companies and the individuals say, okay, that's a cost of doing business, I'll pay this, and nobody, nobody applies for leniency because nobody's scared. And I think that's what's happened in Russia, and I think probably in Ukraine, if, if you even have one, I think you do. Uh, but leniency only works if you have really serious punishment, probably even criminal punishment. For other kinds of agreements, horizontal agreements, we simply do what we call a rule of reason analysis which is what we do with the rest of our competition law enforcement, which is we investigate thoroughly the legal and economic aspects of the deal. In this case, there usually is a written agreement, an R&D joint venture, for example. And we try to evaluate whether there, A, whether there is a loss of competition involved in setting up this joint venture, and B, if there is, whether that is necessary to make the joint venture work. Sometimes joint venture partners have to agree not to co-op, not to compete really hard or they won't cooperate with each other, they won't trust each other. And then C, if it is necessary to make it work, whether it's worth, whether the benefits are worth the cost. So it's essentially a cost-benefit analysis. And we would, we would certainly not, if we found that, if we found that a joint venture agreement was on balance anti-competitive, we would certainly not see criminal punishment we wouldn't even seek a fine. We would sit, simply try to get the company, persuade the company, or if necessary, sue the company to stop the joint venture because we felt that it was anti-competitive, or to rewrite the contract to get rid of the, the anti-competitive provisions. Vertical agreements. We have a lot of vertical agreements in the economy. Um, agreements between a supplier and the manu its manufacturer or customer or the manufacturer and its distributor. Um, exclusive, exclusive contracts are deals we see very often, in which it, maybe the iron ore company says to the steel company, um, if you want my iron ore, you can't buy anybody else's iron ore. Or the steel company says to the iron ore company, if you want to sell me iron ore, you can't sell to anybody else. Um, we see most favored nation clauses, if you sell at this if you sell at a lower price to anybody, you have to give me that lower price too. Uh, tying agreements, where the tying is, uh, is a metaphor here. If you want to buy product X from me, you have to buy product Y. Sometimes those are called, or those are related to what's called bundling agreements. Resale price maintenance. If you, if you, the retailer, want to sell my, want to sell my razor blades, you have to charge X for them. You can't discount. Them. Those kinds of agreements we see frequently. They are not per se illegal. None of them are per se illegal. Some of them used to be, but they're not anymore. Um, and they're basically only a problem where at least one of the firms is in a dominant position. If neither of the firms has any market power, we're generally not worried about them. If I, if I sign an exclusive agreement with a supplier, but I have only 5% of the market, I'm not tying up that supply in any sense that's going to harm other competitors. If I have 75% of the market, I may be. And so I'm going to talk about vertical agreements in the context of the second set of issues, which is abuse of a dominant position in the market. Sherman Act Section 2 says that firms may not monopolize or seek to monopolize a market. The treaty for Europe, is it the Rome Treaty now, is it the Lisbon Treaty, and I forget these things. Article 102 says abuse of a dominant position in a market is prohibited. In Ukraine, it's Articles 12 and 13 of the Competition Law. aspect of the abuse of a dominant position as an offense is that it is, in a certain obvious way, a two-part offense. 
First of all, just to be in a dominant position is not illegal under any competition law I know of. You can be a dominant firm, large market share, complete control of the market. You can be a monopolist, and that's not a violation of the law. In fact, you know, again, we believe in markets. We've all, at least those of us who are economists, have all read Adam Smith. We hope everybody's trying to be a monopolist. We hope everybody's trying to sell a whole lot and completely dominate their market. And as long as that's all they're doing, that is not a violation of the law. So it's not a, it's not a violation to have a position of dominance. You must abuse it to violate the law. But at the same time, you can't abuse a dominant position if you don't have a dominant position. And that means that firms that have a small position in the market are allowed to do things that firms which have market power are not allowed to do. There are certain things that Google and Microsoft cannot do that you or I, if we entered their markets, would be perfectly free to do. And my friend Bill Kovacic, who used to be chairman of the FTC and now is in private practice, says he tells his clients, okay, when you get about 50% of a market, you have to change your behavior. You can't do things you used to do anymore. And you better self-police, because if you don't, the authorities are going to police it for you. So when you get to be something like a dominant position, there are things you can't do anymore. You have to behave more like, if you will, a statesman than always, in some ways, an aggressive, young, hungry competitor. There are two types of abuse, speaking broadly. Expropriative and exclusionary. Expropriative abuses are abuses that simply take all the money on the table, that take everything that really screw over your negotiating partner. I'm dominant, you're not, therefore you're going to pay me every penny of what you're willing to pay. Uh, charging high prices, taking unfair advantage of customers. In general, those are not abuses in the US. They are mostly not abuses in the EU. They are sometimes abuses in, for example, Ukraine, Russia, in the former socialist world, Poland, Romania. Sometimes these are prosecuted as abuses, not very often. In Russia, they, the uh, anti-monopoly authority has gone after the big oil companies, for example, for high prices that are resulted in high gasoline prices. But it's been very clear to the entire world that they're only bringing that case because Mr. Putin said gasoline prices are too high. What's the anti-monopoly service doing about it? And so, OK, we'll bring a case of abuse of dominance. I don't think they would have brought it up. The abuses that competition authorities care more about are so-called exclusionary abuses. Abuses that prevent the ability of smaller firms or entrants to compete on what we call a level playing field. Those are the abuses that we worry about. Those are the abuses we bring cases against. So in a standard abuse of dominance case, we would first of all define the market, both the product market and the geographic market. In other words, decide what products are the products that customers are choosing among. What are the closest substitutes for customers? Those are the market. Um, we would analyze possible barriers to entry into the market, whether they were licensing or patent agreements or uh, the need for a large plant to achieve economies of scale or um, uh, product differentiation, heavy advertising expenses. So if we define the market, and the market was a market in which there were high barriers to entry, and the firm had a high market share, now what is a high market share? That depends on the law. Different laws require different market shares. But that would, if we decided the firm was, had a high market share in a market with high barriers to entry, that would satisfy the first step Yes, the firm is in a dominant position. So now the second step, is this behavior exclusionary? Does this behavior, in fact, constitute an abuse of dominance? Does it, in fact, seriously inconvenience or make it harder for a competitor to compete in the market? And that's a judgment call, and it depends on the conditions. It depends on barriers to entry into other markets. Um, it very often involves the case, it very often involves the issue of,
can a smaller competitor get access to something that that competitor needs in order to compete in the market? So it might be the dominant firm signing an exclusive supply agreement. The first case I mentioned here is that one of the first cases the Hungarian competition agency brought. There was a company called Borsche Beer that had sort of a regional monopoly, and you can look this up on the Hungarian competition agency website. This company had a sort of a regional monopoly in beer sales, and as its monopoly started being challenged by other brewers, it imposed an exclusive dealing requirement on its distributors. It said to the trucking and distribution companies that were distributing Borsche beer to the bars and taverns and shops, if you want to sell, if you want to distribute Borsche beer, you can't distribute anybody else's beer. Now, you know, in the U.S., that probably wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't or in the E.C., that probably wouldn't, wouldn't be an abuse because it wouldn't be a serious disadvantage. In Hungary in 1993, it was hard to get private trucking. It was hard to get distribution. And so the Hungarian Competition Agency brought and won a case against Borsche beer for denying access to that essential input to its competitors. I've listed all the, also the Microsoft case, our big, our big Microsoft case, which you can read a lot more about. Um, Microsoft, as some of you probably know, uh, in the late 90s was worried. Uh, it, had a, it had, by any measure, a dominant share of operating systems for PCs. It was worried that browsers were developing to such an extent that you wouldn't need an operating system anymore. That uh, Netscape was getting so good and the developers of apps for Netscape were getting so good that people in the future would be able to buy a PC, use a web browser, and get a spreadsheet, a word processing, email, whatever, and you wouldn't need an operating system. So Microsoft developed Internet Explorer to compete with Netscape. Okay, so far so good. They're developing a new product to compete. Great, good work, guys. But then it went to the PC manufacturers and said, Hey, by the way, if you want Windows, you have to put Internet Explorer on the first screen. And you can't, they can't use Netscape at all. Or if you really insist, you can use Netscape, but it has to be on the third or fourth screen. And once Microsoft did that to the PC manufacturers, they, of course, had to have Windows. You couldn't sell the PC, unless you were Apple, you couldn't sell a PC without Windows in the late 90s. So the PC manufacturers, Dell and all the others, said, well, okay, I guess we've got to do this. And so one of my colleagues still has in his office the court exhibit of the market share of Netscape from the point that Microsoft started doing this. And it's a real fast falling line because Microsoft was really able to use its dominant position to disadvantage its competitor. Okay, those are examples of how you might use a, um, a dominant position to be exclusionary. Mergers and acquisitions. Uh, Section seven of the Clayton Act uh, it's a regulation in, uh, in the EU because, like the Clayton Act, the EU added this later. It wasn't part of the original uh, treaty. Ukrainian law, Articles 22 to 25. Most of our attention is paid to horizontal mergers, but we do worry some about vertical mergers. Again, especially for the same reasons we worry about abuse of dominance and exclusionary abuses, because if a firm doesn't sign an exclusive agree agreement with its distributor, but it buys its distributor, then under certain conditions that might harm competition, denying access to its competitors. Increasingly around the world, companies have to pre-notify a competition agency before they merge. Usually there's a sales requirement or an asset requirement. If you're a firm above this size, and you have a certain level of sales, maybe in this country, um, you have to tell the competition agency in advance of your merger, and the law gives the agency a certain amount of time to investigate. Um, U.S. was first to do this. We did it in the 1970s, because we were tired of reading in the Wall Street Journal about mergers that had already taken place. Uh, so we got the law to say, okay, you have a certain amount of time, you have a certain process by which you, DOJ or FTC, can ask for more information and only then can the companies merge. And that there's a limit on how long it can take, but it gives us time to investigate. And most competition laws now require this. It makes perfect sense. The Ukrainian competition agency needs time to investigate a merger rather than trying to go ex post. The 
problem is, of course, if you're a multinational agency, you, ha you might have 75 countries that you have to pre-notify in, and each country's requirements are a little different, so you may have to hire 75 law firms. Great for my lawyer friends in the audience, not so great for the companies. Um, and so the companies, and I think very legitimately, are saying, please, could you guys standardize this? I mean, I don't know, go, go to the WTO, go to OECD, whatever. Agree among yourselves at least on what form we can file. First, we know each of you is going to do your own investigation later, but if you could just at least agree on an initial form, but we don't do it. We haven't done it. Uh, there have been discussions for it, but we all, you know, we all have different things we want to investigate. And the U.S. Competition Agency and the Indian Competition Agency get together and say, no, I think the form should be this way, and so we don't agree on it. All right, let's talk about the standard methodology that we use for analyzing a horizontal merger. Um, if, you, if you are a lawyer or an economist, uh, you may want to go on the USDOJ website or the FTC website and read the formal language of our merger guidelines because we have a formal document that we've revised over the years that lays out this methodology. So what do we do? First of all, as with abusive dominance, we define the market. We define the product market and we define the geographic market. We generally use what we call the hypothetical monopolist test. Um, and that's simply, we simply ask ourselves, and we may be able to answer this question with fancy statistics, or we may not, um, what is the product or group of products that a company could monopolize? If I had a monopoly over a, partic over a particular product or group of products, could I monopolize it? Could I charge a monopoly price? And that's what we define a market as. So let's say, we had, let's say we had a merger of two producers of aspirin. Um, we might, the first question we would ask is, is aspirin a product market? If you had a monopoly of aspirin, could you monopolize it? Could you raise the price? And the answer would be, well, you could raise the price somewhat maybe, but some people would switch to ibuprofen, some people would switch to acetaminophen, some people would switch to their grandmother's chicken soup. Some people would switch to vodka. Um, and the question would be, it would be an empirical question, which might or might not have a statistical answer. Could you raise the price, and we have, we have all this fancy language, could you, the fancy language is, could you raise the price by a small but significant and non-transitory amount? A small but significant and non-transitory increase in price. SNP. It is our SNP test. A small but significant and non-transitory increase in price. Two of my students on my midterm this year uh, referred to the SNP test. Does it smell like a novel? I had to mark them off on that even though I enjoyed it. Um, so we asked the product market question. We also asked the geographic market question. Suppose we found that aspirin were a product, or a product market. That, you, that enough people wanted aspirin and not acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And so you could monopolize, in principle, the aspirin market. The next question would be the geographic question. Could you monopolize the Ukrainian aspirin market? And we focus on what the customer's choices are. We ask, what could the customer buy? And it might not be today. It might be next week or next month. But so, for example, if I raise the price of Ukrainian aspirin, this is the hypothetical monopolist, to a monopoly level, would Polish aspirin or Russian aspirin or German aspirin from Bayer flood the market? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe there are barriers to entry. Maybe, maybe it would take two years to get regulatory approval. Maybe, maybe if they were Polish aspirin, people wouldn't want to buy Polish aspirin because they wouldn't trust it. No, I only trust Ukrainian aspirin. I don't know if that's realistic, but maybe it could, could happen. We would look, and so the question would be, if, you could, if somebody else could very easily enter the market in response to a bad SNP, SNP price increase, then they would be included in the market. So maybe, in fact, we would find in this hypothetical merger of aspirin companies an aspirin product market, but a European geographic market, or a world geographic market. Maybe American aspirin could compete, or Brazilian aspirin could compete. Um, essentially, what we're doing here, since this is a micro-conference, microeconomic conference, Essentially, we're trying to figure out what the elasticities of demand are, the own price elasticities for the firm, and the cross price elasticities among products. So, you know, if, 
We're, if we have the, the data, and we might have scanner data from the supermarkets, if we had the data, we would, we would try to test what's the cross-price elasticity between aspirin and acetaminophen. And if we have enough price variation and enough, uh, enough coverage, we might have an answer to that. And if it's significantly, let's see, a cross-price elasticity would be positive. It's significantly positive, they are substitutes, and they're in the same market. If we can't find a coefficient significantly different from zero, then they're not in the same market, and we don't have to include them. Again, after we've defined the market, we look for barriers to entry. If there are significant barriers to entry into the market, we're going to be concerned about firms that have significantly high market shares wanting to merge. Then we're going to do something which we didn't used to do so much. We're going to examine the quote-unquote competitive effects of the merger. And this requires us essentially to distinguish between homogeneous goods and differentiated products. If you look at our older merger guidelines, before 1992, which was the set that added coordinated effects, you know, that added unilateral effects. We mostly focused on homogeneous goods and we worried about collusion. We focused on standardized products like steel and newsprint and aluminum that had a single price in the market. And we worried that as the number of sellers got smaller, they would be able to coordinate, either explicitly or tacitly. In the 80s and 90s, we started having more and more cases where that wasn't really the issue, where the products weren't standardized, but they were differentiated. Consumer goods. We started seeing consumer good products where, you know, Colgate toothpaste is different from Crest toothpaste. And they advertise differently, and one of them has fluoristan, and the other one does whitening, and they might not have the same price. They might have different prices, they, and they issue coupons, and they're doing all this stuff, and consumers are choosing on a lot of different uh, bases rather than just price. Uh, in fact, what we started doing, and again, since this is a microeconomics conference, we started thinking in terms of hoteling models, Harold Hoteling's models of geographic differentiation of goods. And in Hoteling's models, or Steve Salop's models, which puts them in a circle, Hoteling puts them on a line, different goods have different characteristics. In the original model, it's just location, but it's clear that we're talking about product characteristics. So different goods have different characteristics. You can put it on a line in one dimension, but it might be two or three or four dimensions. And the question is, if these companies, these differentiated companies, are merging, how close are they in hoteling space? How close are they? Because if they're very close, we think they're probably competing pretty closely with each other for the same customers. And therefore, the merger is going to reduce that incentive to compete. If they're very distant, we figure probably there aren't very many customers on the margin anyway, and so the merger's not going to harm competition. And let me give you an example which about half of you in the audience will appreciate better than the other half, which was our great women's cosmetics merger of the 1990s. This was one of our first differentiated products merger, um, and we got a pre-notification pre that L'Oreal and Maybelline wanted to merge. And we looked into all the products they produce, and they produce a whole lot of cosmetic products. And you gentlemen in the audience don't know about half of these. I can tell you, there's all these secret products. And <laughs> foundation and blush and you know all the stuff you didn't even know about. Um, but they produce all these products and compete with each other. And they were both important producers in most of these products. Um, we decided to focus on the market where they had the highest market shares, which was mascara. Too shuffly in your in your language here, guys. You may all think that all the ladies in the audience here have beautiful long eyelashes naturally, but in fact, according to statistics, about 70% of them are using an artificial product called Touche to uh, make those eyelashes even longer and more beautiful. <laughs> uh, and it turned out that L'Oreal and Maybelline were the number one and number two sellers of Touche in the U.S. market. Okay, we'll call it mascara. Um, and so we were thinking, you know, okay, mascara, eyeliner, blush, lipstick, they all have these big market shares in this product. There aren't that many big sellers. Uh, we're thinking of challenging the merger. The merger. And the companies came in to us and they said, no, 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 you don't understand this product market at all. <laughs> Maybelline 
let's think of a hotel in line. If I had a, if I had a uh, board I would write. Maybelline is over here on this side of the line. It sold for, let's say, um, 200 grivnas a tube. And you buy it at the Optica or you buy it at a kiosk on the street. Um, and it competes with Cover Girl and Wet and Wild. And high school and college girls use Maybelline. L'Oreal is over here on this side of the telling line. It sells for a thousand grivnas a tube. I'm making up the number, obviously. It's sold at Macy's and the very fancy stores that the wives of oligarchs go to. And it's sold by it's sold by ladies in white coats to look like there's something kind of official about it or medical about it. And they sit you in a chair and they say, oh yeah, this is the one you need. No, 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 let's, let's try this one. You know, these ladies are doing that. And it competes with Elizabeth Arden and um, Clinique and those products. Let me tell you, DOJ, said these guys, there are no high school girls who, if you raise the price of Maybelline by 5%, are going to say, oh, okay, I'll go buy L'Oreal. And there are no wives of oligarchs who, if you raise the price of L'Oreal by 5%, are saying, okay, I'll just use cover girl, no problem. There are no women on the margin. And we ended up agreeing with them. We ended up not challenging the merger. Absolutely on this basis, absolutely on the basis of a hoteling model that these guys were too far distant from each other on a hoteling line, on a product differentiation line for us to be worried about. Well, the last thing we look at with a standard horizontal merger analysis is efficiencies. We do take into account the possibility that the merger will, in fact, lower a company's prices. And that's good for society. That's an efficiency. That's a benefit. And in fact, in my microeconomic models, usually if a company can lower, has lower costs, it will charge lower prices. So maybe that's even taxable on customers. So we consider that as well. And we may, in principle at least, although it's pretty rare, we may accept an argument that this merger would be so beneficial, so pro-competitive, that it would not be challenged, even with the, even though it would, on its face, greatly increase market share. Well, as I said, I, I'm not going to really address these two other issues that are more European. Um, we don't focus in the U.S. on protectionist behavior by uh, local by local firms. That's Articles 59. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not. Uh, 150 different articles, so that's a typo, but it's, uh, it's Article 106 of the Treaty of Rome, and I think maybe Articles 15 to 17, that should read, of the Ukrainian law. Um, we don't do state aids in the U.S., which is an important part of European enforcement under Article 107, and a separate Ukrainian law on state aids for undertaking. So just to conclude, um, a reminder of how I started. The competition law is focused on the process of competition. We're not focused on outcomes. We're not looking for monopoly profits. We're looking to make sure that markets can work. We believe in markets, and we want to make sure markets work. So as the US Supreme Court said, competition law protects competition, not competitors. And sometimes it may protect competitors while it protects competition. Adam Smith, every, bit, every competition enforcer's favorite quote, people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. 1776, he said that. It's probably true even then, and it's still true now. We focus on letting the markets work and on blocking actions by companies, and occasionally by governments, mostly by companies, that would interfere with that. OK, so now I think, according to the schedule, we have questions. Sir, we have microphones, I think. One moment. Are well, there any cases when, for example, you say yes, do that what you want, and then you found out that this wasn't stable. And for example, there was some abuse. Um, there, in, in principle, in principle, we could, for example, decide not to challenge a merger, and the merger could take place, and we could find that oh, this created a dominant firm. Um, we should have challenged it, and we could go back and either challenge the merger ex post, or more likely, we would challenge the behavior as an abuse of dominance. Um, I don't know of any case where we've done that. 
We, there, there are cases, it depends on the law, there are cases where smaller firms don't have to pre-notify. And so we still, in some cases, hear about the merger afterwards, but we still have jurisdiction. And so there have, there, there have been several cases where we have challenged the merger after it takes place because they weren't required to notify us. I don't know of a case where the companies have actually asked us. They can come in and ask us before they do something. Would you challenge it? And we will tell them yes or no. When we say that, we always say, A, if circumstances differ, our answer changes. And B, we cannot commit. We may be smarter five years from now and decide this is harmful. But in fact, we've never gone back on that. We have, we have always, we have never challenged something that we said we wouldn't challenge. Yes? Okay. First of all, thank you a lot for your presentation. It was really interesting from both like theoretical perspective and practical ones. Good. So that's really great. Thank you. And uh, second of all, yeah, you mentioned this three pillars, say, of like uh, anti uh, monopoly of competition laws, like uh, agreements among the firms, uh, abuse of governance, and merchant acquisition. Yes. Um, so my question is about uh, which of them, from your perspective, is like can be considered as the most harmful for markets, and like particular in Ukrainian cases, which of these like pillars needs to be improved the most? Like it's it's, it's just your opinion. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, 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 can't I can't really say about what needs to be improved in, in Ukraine. I don't, I don't really know the, the situation enough in terms of the actual law and its application. But you can ask the next speaker that. Uh, but but I, I would say, in general, especially if you had one of my lawyer colleagues up here, they would say cartels are the most serious. And that's why they get criminal punishment. Because they so directly result almost always, we believe they almost always result in higher prices. Having said that, I will say that generally in a post-socialist country, whether it's Ukraine or Russia or Romania or Poland, you have this legacy of dominant firms in a lot of markets. And they may be protected by, uh, by government regulations, by import tariffs, by whatever. And so I think more in post-socialist countries than in, the, than in the traditional market countries like the US and EU, you have a lot more maybe abuse of dominance to worry about because you have more dominant firms probably than you do. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Two questions. First of all, have you ever faced with the case where the small firm blaming uh, about uh, monopoly position or dominant position other companies and how you operate with them, how you interact? Uh, and then it looks like you have a great team of uh, analytics that do the ground job. And how you can protect them from the wrong decision or the people influence on, on decision, correct? Um, the first question, if I understood you, do we ever have small firms competing about bad behavior by large firms? And the answer is yes, all the time. And sometimes we find they have a legitimate gripe that somebody is doing something abusive. And sometimes we find they just can't compete with the larger firm. So we investigate. I mean, it's, you know, we, we um, the percentage of times we, we're very happy to say that, the, that a large percentage of our investigations don't lead to cases. You know, we find out the market's working, we think somebody's very efficient, great. Turn out the lights go home early tonight. So that's fine. Um, the second question was, oh, um, how do we, we, obviously we don't, you know, we're only, whether it's 1980 or 2016, we're only as smart as we, we're only, we can only be as smart as we are. So we know that we are economists and lawyers and analysts who don't know everything. And there are gonna be new articles in the journals in the next five years that are gonna teach us things we don't know. So we hope we don't make mistakes. We hope we're modest about what we do know. But probably the most important factor is that in any case that we work on in the U.S., and I don't know if this is true yet in Ukraine, but it will be, I expect, the companies are hiring their own economists and lawyers. And they're coming in and saying, oh yeah, that's a great model you put together, Dr. Pittman, but here's the real model that applies to this case. And your model doesn't apply because of this, this, this. And, and you know, they're, 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 they're saying in a very friendly way, they're saying, we understand, you don't understand how this business works. You're not a steel industry guy. But here's how the steel industry works, and here's why your model doesn't work. Or, and this is especially the case with the bigger companies, 
here's our fancy econometrician who can do stuff you can't even do. And he's going to show you his results. And he's going to show you a zero cross price elasticity of demand. Um, I'll tell my colleague from the AMCU, if Jerry Hausman ever comes in here from MIT, he's going to show you a zero cross price elasticity of demand. I guarantee it. So now we can find one everywhere. Um, but that's the answer. I mean, we, it's, it's, the lawyers would tell you that's what the adversarial process is good for. That's why we go to court and have, and have a burden of proof. Because we have to convince a judge, or if it's a criminal case, a jury, that we're right. And if we can't convince them, then we lose. And sometimes we don't bring cases because even though we're convinced we're right, we don't think we can convince a judge. I've been in cases like that. And it's very, it's very frustrating because we really think this merger will be harmful, but we don't think we can convince a judge and we don't want to go in and, and lose. Uh, speaking of business as a system, uh, have you probably noted any uh, meta systematic differences in the United States and in Ukraine uh, with respect to what are the targets of those uh, mergers? Meaning, is there any uh, scarce resources that has been uh, like a target that gives uh, significant benefit, maybe some social uh, aspects? Uh, do, have you spotted any differences of, no. of um, targets yeah. that are, of course, you know, business climate is quite different? It's a very good question, and, and again, I'm not really in a position to answer because I haven't really studied the Ukrainian experience. I'm here teaching at Kiev School of Economics, but I'm not a specialist in what's happened up to now. Again, I'll, I'll say sort of what I said in the previous question was, um, you're in a country that, as I understand it, in comparison with the US, has a lot more firms in dominant positions in critical industries. So, you know, it, I expect the Anti-Monopoly Committee is worried about access to raw materials or access to distribution by small firms, maybe foreign firms, maybe new entrants into these markets. Because we see all the time, even in the US and EC, we see a firm with 75% of the market trying to make sure that those other guys can't chip away at its business. You know, let's, let's sign up the best distributors and we'll have exclusive deals with them and then our competitors have to use some, some inferior distributors. So I expect it's a real problem here, but again, I just, I can't speak to the, to the Ukrainian experience. But again, I believe the next speaker can. <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned that this antitrust law mostly works on the national level, but what happens, for example, if two firms have an exclusive cartel agreement, but these firms come from two different countries and they decide to differentiate the markets in some way? Say, we export here and you export there. Is there anything that can be done in such cases? Yes, yes, very good question. Um, we in the US and the EC and I think pretty much every competition law claim extraterritorial jurisdiction which means if you do something that harms U.S. markets, we can attack you for it. And that includes an international cartel, and generally the international cartels that we have prosecuted have been everybody still selling in the U.S., just raising prices. But if, if the three vitamin companies or auto parts companies, to take two, two examples of, uh, of markets where we've had cartels, if they agreed, okay, I'm going to only sell in the U.S. and you're going to only sell in the E.C., that would absolutely be a potentially criminal uh, per se violation and we would seek criminal punishment for that. It would be a pure cartel agreement that we would argue in U.S. court would harm U.S. customers. Now, it would be up to the E.C. to prove harm in the E.C., in the E.U., but, but we, would attack it at, we would attack it using the extraterritorial jurisdiction of our law as an illegal cartel agreement that harmed U.S. customers, absolutely. And we, have put, we have put foreign executives in jail. We have, they, have, they have come to the U.S. and volunteered to go to jail rather than live the rest of their lives in a situation where if they tried to enter the U.S. they'd be arrested at the uh, passport office, which is what would happen otherwise. I have a question about state aid problem mentioned a bit. State aid? Uh, state aid, yes. I, I don't know anything about state aid, I'm sorry. <laughs> next, next speaker. <laughs> sorry. We just don't have that issue in the U.S., so I don't know anything about it. Sorry. Uh, so it's a lot for this interesting and uh, interactive presentation. Uh, we would like to present to our books or our partners. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all.